In this video, we'll talk about how we use matrices and echelon forms to talk about solutions to linear systems. So in the last couple of lectures, we've talked about echelon form and reduced echelon form, and we've also talked about how to use row operations to put a matrix into one of those forms. But now we really need to think about why do we care if a matrix is in echelon form or reduced echelon form? What does that get us? So remember that when we have a system of linear equations, we can construct that corresponding augmented matrix, and then using row operations to put that matrix in echelon form will turn out to make it easier to analyze the solutions to those systems of equations. So let's do an example. Let's consider this system of equations. The first thing we'll want to do is construct the augmented matrix. Here's what the augmented matrix looks like. Now remember that whenever we don't see a coefficient, we can think of that coefficient as just being 1. When a variable is missing, we can think of that coefficient as being 0. So if you're wondering where some of these extra numbers are coming from, that's just filling in these gaps. So each of these coefficients, so for example, the first column is 1, 1, 0, so we get 1, 1, 0. Negative 6, negative 9, 6, negative 6, negative 9, 6. So that's where we get our augmented matrix. The first column corresponds to x1, the second column corresponds to x2, the third column corresponds to x3, the fourth column corresponds to x4, and then the last column corresponds to the other side of the equation. Now when we perform the row reduction operations, we can put this matrix into reduced echelon form, which looks like this. So now we want to think about what does that tell us about the original system of equations. Remember that since each of the row operations is reversible, any solution to the system of equations that we get from doing one of those operations is going to be the same regardless of the operation that we did. So the equations that we get by looking at this reduced echelon form are going to be easier to think about, and the solutions to those easier equations are going to be the same as the solutions of the original set of equations. So when we look at the equations corresponding to the reduced row echelon form, notice a few things. We've got three pivots here, here, and here, in columns 1, 2, and 4, and those correspond to the variables x1, x2, and x4 appearing in those equations. Notice that since that number 1, those pivots, is the only non-zero number in that column, that means that in all of our equations, x1 only appears once, x2 only appears once, and x4 only appears once. x3, since the third column wasn't a pivot column, we can get multiple x3s but the pivot columns give us only one copy of that variable. So we call the variables that correspond to pivot columns, we call those basic variables. And the non-pivot columns, not counting the last column, which doesn't correspond to a variable, we call those corresponding variables free variables. So in this case, x1, x2, and x4 are basic variables, and x3 is a free variable. So now we can take those equations and solve them for the basic variable. Remember, every basic variable will only appear once, and it'll appear with a coefficient of 1. So solving for the basic variable will just be as simple as adding or subtracting the other free variables from both sides of the equation, if necessary, to get the variable by itself. So we get the solution in this form. x1 equals 9x3 plus 4. x2 equals negative 3x3 minus 1. We just simply write the words x3 is free. And then the last equation is x4 equals negative 7. So what does that actually tell us about the solutions to our, uh, to our original system of equations? Well, x3 being a free variable means that x3 can be whatever value we want. Every value of x3 is going to correspond to a different solution. So that means that we can pick whatever value for x3 that we want, and that will give us a solution to this equation. So for example, I could say x3 equals 5 and then x1 would equal 9 times x3 plus 4. That would be 9 times 5 plus 4, which is 49. x2 would be negative 3x3 minus 1. That's negative 3 times 5 minus 1. That's negative 16. And x4 would equal negative 7. So that would give me a solution of 49 comma negative 16 comma 5 comma negative 7. Remember that we write our solutions as ordered tuples, where the first thing in the ordered tuple represents the first variable, x1, the second number represents x2, third number represents x3, which we chose to be 5, and the fourth number represents x4. But we could pick a completely different number for x3. Maybe x3 equals negative 1. 
then x1 would be 9 times x3 plus 4, that would be minus 5. x2 would be negative 3 times x3 minus 1, that would be 2, and then x4 would be negative 7. And so in this case, my solution would be negative 5, negative, positive 2, negative 1, and then negative 7, and so on. And we don't have to pick whole number values for x3 either. x3 can be any real number. It can be a rational number, it can be an irrational number, any real number would work. So we get an infinite number of solutions, a different solution for each value of x3 that we choose. So here's the process for solving a system of linear equations. The first thing we want to do is create the associated augmented matrix. Next, we use the steps that we learned in the previous lecture to row reduce that matrix into reduced echelon form. Once we have it in reduced echelon form, we rewrite it back in terms of the original equations and the original variables. Solve each equation for each, each basic variable, and that gives you a way to describe your solutions. Sometimes we don't want specific solutions, but we actually just want to understand the, the nature of the solutions. So for example, we might want to know if the system has any solutions at all. In that case, we use the word consistent. So consistent means that there is at least one solution. Does the system have exactly one unique solution, or does it have, as in the previous example, many solutions? The echelon form, rather than the reduced echelon form, is sufficient to answer these questions. So if all we want to know is the nature of the solutions, we don't have to work as hard. We don't have to get to the reduced echelon form. We just need an echelon form. So for example, let's consider this system of equations. The first thing we want to do is write the augmented matrix for this system. So we have four equations, which means we're going to have four rows for our matrix. We have four variables, which means we're going to have five columns for our matrix. One column for each variable, and then in the last column indicating the other side of the equal sign. So in my first equation, I have 2x1, so I put a 2. I don't have any x2s, so I put a 0. 6x3, 7x4, equals 7. For my second equation, I have 6x1s, I have no x2s, I have 18x3s, 24x4s, equaling 6. In the third equation, I have 2x1s, negative 1x2s, no x3s, 5x4s, and that equals 14. And then finally, I have, in the fourth equation, I have no x1s, 2x2s, 12x3s, 4x4s, and that equals negative 10. The next step will be to row reduce this matrix. Once we row reduce that matrix, we can get this echelon form. Notice that I could work harder and get this into a reduced echelon form, but already this is going to be enough to tell us something about the solutions to this system of equations. Take a look at this last row. Remember that the next step of our process will be to rewrite our echelon form back in terms of the equations. But this last row, what equation does that represent? Well, that represents 0x1s plus 0x2s plus 0x3s plus 0x4s equaling 4. But on the left-hand side, that's just 0 equaling 4. And that means that the system of, of equations that we're talking about has no solution, because 0 does not equal 4. No matter what x1, x2, and x3, and x4 equal, there's no way that this equation will ever be true. And so you can see here that the echelon form is enough for us to answer the question of whether this system has any solutions at all. In this case, the system of equations has no solutions. So what we really need to know about our matrix is where the pivots are. If there is a pivot in the last column, then the system is inconsistent. That means it has no solutions. So that word is important. A system of equations is consistent if it has any solutions. The system is inconsistent if it has no solutions. So if the linear system is consistent, in other words, if it has any solutions, then the solution set either has a unique solution, which will happen if there are no free variables, or there will be infinitely many solutions if there are one or more free variables. Because if there's a free variable, then every value of that free variable will give us another solution, and so we'll have infinitely many solutions because there's infinitely many numbers that we could choose for the value of that free variable. So there's really three possibilities. No solutions, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. And we can figure out which one of those, those scenarios we're in simply by knowing where the pivots of the, of the matrix are.